Hello, Mike here. Now, one thing that we've talked about before with large language models is that they're not very good at mathematics. If it's a super simple maths question, then maybe you're in luck. But if you're asking something more complex, especially with a large data set, an analytical problem that you want to have solved, that's not what large language models are going to be able to do for you. But one thing they can do is write code. So if we can take code that the large language model writes and then run it on behalf of the large language model and provide that data back again, now we're on track to be able to answer these more complex questions. So in this video, I'm going to show you what's behind this. Here's a simple chatbot which I've created. And if I ask it a question such as plot a graph of a Fibonacci sequence, Actually, a large language model may have seen that kind of thing before. So let's say plot a graph of an inverse Fibonacci sequence. And let's say uh, minus um, 123. I don't know, something that is unlikely to have been plotted before. Now, if I send that into this particular agent, then after a short while and a little magic edit, it comes back with this, exactly what I wanted, this graph. So how did it manage to do this? Well, it wrote some Python code, we ran it for it in a sandboxed secure environment, and it brought back what we wanted. Let me show you how to do this. So if we go to Amazon Bedrock, here I've got an agent that I've started to build because it's an agentic workflow that we're going to use for this. So here is my demo agent because no imagination. And inside of here, I've selected the Claude 3 Sonnet model to be the model behind the agent, and I've given it some instructions. Now we'll look at these instructions in a tiny bit more detail later, but they're fairly extensive talking about how to solve mathematical problems and how to be analytical in your thinking using a tool to run Python code on your behalf. Now, I haven't enabled that yet, but I get to do that by clicking on Additional Settings and going to Enable for Code Interpreter. It's in public preview as I'm recording this video, and it connects a Python execution sandbox environment to this agent so it can perform, well, exactly what we just saw happen. So if I go back up to the top here, click Save, then my agent's ready to go. Now I could show you this working in the playground environment inside the console, but what I really want to do is show you how to do this programmatically so you can build it into your own application. So here I have a Jupyter Notebook with all of the code that you'll need to get a sample of this up and running. And yes, a link to this is in the description beneath this video. So let's jump right into it. Let's load some Python libraries. I'm including matplotlib here because I want to be able to plot the graphs out to the screen as we're watching it here, if we, if we have graphs. Um, and we've also got Boto3, of course, which is the SDK for AWS for Python. So let's skip through this. We're going to define ourselves a region that we're going to work in. Now, this needs to be a region that supports Bedrock. It needs to support agents. And you need to have the correct models enabled inside of your account as well. And this particular one, we're going to be using the Sonnet model from Anthropic. So with the region selected, let's go and create our agent. Now, this next cell of code here is huge. There's lots of things going on. So let's quickly step through it, and then I'll press play. Essentially, what it does is it creates an agent. It then um, adds to it the code interpreter, and it makes it ready for us to be able to play around with all in one go. So we're going to use the bedrock agent um, endpoint here. So the client for our Boto3 is the bedrock agent. There's two of these. There's bedrock agent. There's bedrock, a bedrock agent runtime. So the bedrock agent one is the one that we need for configuring the service. The bedrock agent runtime one is the one that we use to work with the agent once we've created it. So I'm going to use some Python code here to create the agent. I'm also going to create some IAM resources because we need to create a policy for our agent to use. So I'm going to define a name that I want to use for this. Um, and then here is our instruction. So this is the instruction that I actually had in the console just a moment ago. So you're an advanced AI agent with capabilities in code execution 
and on it goes. Now, I actually used Anthropic's Claude model itself to help me write this system prompt, because that's essentially what this is. This is a large part of what essentially will become the system prompt, um, which just talks through how to do problem solving data analysis. It doesn't give it code examples, but gives it a sense of how its personality can be used to create the solutions to the problems that we have. So that's a big long prompt. Look through it in your own time. Um, then we are going to define which model we want to use, and we want to use the sonnet model. Um, we're going to get a random uh, suffix such that we can create resources with unique names. And then we get into the creation of stuff. Um, so here we're going to create the IAM policy. So it's got a trust policy so that this is going to allow Bedrock itself to call a bedrock model. In this case, it's going to be the sonnet model in our region that we're working in. So we're going to call um, IAM create role to make that and put role policy to create a role with an attached policy. Once we've got that, then we can get on with creating the actual agent itself. Now, to do that, we're going to call the create agent function on top of the bedrock agent. We're going to pass in basically all of those parameters that we defined just above, so the agent name, the model that we're going to use, the instruction, and the role. Um, and then we need to wait for it to become not prepared. So the next state after preparing or, or creating is for it to get into this not prepared state. So we we'll just wait for that. And then we're going to attach an action group. Now, action groups inside of agents are where the tools live. And so if you're making your own action group, you can have your own tools that go and connect to whatever you want. This is a special one. This is a special one for Code Interpreter. So we're going to create an action group. We're going to call it Code Interpreter Action. We're going to enable it. We're going to attach it to the draft version, because at this point, we don't have any other versions of our agent. But this is what's really important here, this parent action group signature value. This value of Amazon.CodeInterpreter will convert or make this action group into our code interpreter action group. That's all this will be, and it's all it ever needs to be. It's a special, if you like, templated action group for executing code. So if you've already got an agent and you've already got your own action groups, you can create another one with this method and create our code interpreter. That's it. That's all we have to do. We don't have to do anything more than that. This is managed for us by the service. So once we've created our action group, we're going to get an action group ID. Note that before we actually got an agent ID. So we've got our agent ID came back. And now we've got our action group ID. We're going to then um, wait for our action group to become enabled. That's the state that we want it to be in. And then we can prepare our agent. So this is the equivalent of clicking the prepare button in the console if you've done that before. Um, we wait for it to become prepared prepared, and that's basically just the status of it. Um, and then we get to create our alias. Now with an agent, once it's created, in order to be able to actually access it from code, we need the agent ID, and we also need an agent alias ID. And this alias links to a version. So basically with this, we're going to have one version, one alias. But the alias gives you the ability to be able to do release control. So you can have different versions running on different aliases. So you've got some control over which client's using which versions. Um, but in this particular case, super simple, one version, one alias ID. So once that's fully prepared, then we get to the end of all of this code with an agent ID and an agent alias ID. That's all we need to be able to work with our agent. So let's run this cell. It's going to zip through this. It should take no more than 30 seconds or so to create all of that for us um, right here inside of the notebook. Now, you can do this as well with things like CloudFormation, but the support by, by CloudFormation for the things that have just come out in public preview, such as Code Interpreter, might not be there yet. So we're doing it in Python Plus. It runs inside of this notebook. So there you go. How long did that take? 21 seconds, 22 seconds, and we're all done. OK, so next up, I'm going to go and grab myself a Bedrock Agent Runtime Client object, the runtime object for me to be able to um, invoke 
our agent. So let's run that and have a look. Now this is a big function I've got here just for the purposes of us testing this, um, but you get to see how the different pieces of code work in here um, for our particular use case. So I've created an invoke function and it's going to basically wrap around invoke agent but it's also going to get the response back from that and print it out to screen so it's be really just a, a play swiss army knife function that i've created um, so we're going to invoke the agent we're going to pass in our question in input text there um, and we're going to use the agent alias id agent id there all of the particular variables and requirements are just listed out here on the right hand side now, if we do want to pass in some of our own data into the agent, then we can do so. And you do that here with session state um, and follow this syntax to be able to maybe send in, for example, a data set. So you can absolutely pass data in as well as receiving data back out as well. So let's um, have a look what we do here. So once we get the response back from invoking the model, we get the completion and we get our event stream. So the event stream is a stream of output that we get from this model. Now, agents don't stream text, but what they do do is they stream some debug information. They will send you a chunk, which is all of the text, which is the output, but all in one go. Um, and it also will send you files in this particular instance as well. So we need to handle that, and that's what this code will do. So we're going to handle the chunks, um, of which there will only be one with any given generation. And so that'll be the text output. And then we've got the files and the file outputs. Now there could be more than one file. So we have to loop through everything that we've got. And we basically grab out the name which is passed back from the environment, the type, so the MIME type of the file and the actual data itself. Now in this particular code, if the data I get back is a PNG or is of type PNG, then we're just going to we're going to render that into the notebook here. If it's anything else, then we'll save it to the disk because we don't really know what to do with it, but we can get access to it and we can look at it there. So that's what this function does. Um, a bit of a catch-all does everything kind of function just to help us test the code interpreter functionality. So let's um, scroll down a little bit and let's set ourselves up with a brand new session. So I'm going to create a session ID and we're going to go ahead and invoke our model. So calculate the sum of the Fibonacci sequence up to 1000. So if I click play on that, then you'll be able to see in seconds here how long this is currently taking in this public preview of Code Interpreter. But what's happening behind the scenes here, and if we were actually to look at the trace, then we could actually see um, the question going in. It being mixed with our system prompt there, that then going off to create a sandbox environment and all these things happening. Well, it's already come back 16 and a half seconds later. The sum of the Fibonacci sequence up to 1000 is 2583. And it's figured that out by running some code, not by trying to figure it out using language. Um, I can say plot the Fibonacci sequence. So this is very similar to the graph that we pulled back uh, a little bit earlier. And so we'll see that obviously it's going to bring back the file and well, it's massive, but it's brought back that graph for us and a bit of text. I've generated the plot of the Fibonacci sequence. So that's it bringing back a file using that uh, section of code that we had, which was right here. OK, and well, let's do something more complex here. So I'm going to restart the session here um, and look at something which is maybe a little bit more typical of the kinds of things you might want this to do. Plotting the Fibonacci sequence, not that useful in the grand scheme of things, but this may well be. So look, we've got here a bunch of text information with some numeric and data information in here about some billing data. So and what we're going to ask it to do is use a billing data provided below to create a bar graph of this data. So categorize it, add it all up, make a graph, and then get some insights from this data. So again, this is not the kind of thing that we could ask a large language model to do normally, because it really wouldn't be able to read and understand this. It certainly wouldn't be able to draw an accurate graph. But if we run this, it will pass this data in um, and hopefully it'll produce this graph for us and we'll see that in just a moment. Now this is the kind of data that you might have gotten from a 
previous step in an agentic workflow. So maybe um, maybe an agent has using, say, for example, the Claude 3 model, which is great at extracting text from images. Maybe it's grabbed an image from the web somewhere. It's seen something. It's abstracted the numeric information here. And now we're passing it into this subsequent step where we're going to produce some output like this. Now, super big, super, super, super big. But you get to see that it has produced the graph and it makes sense. You can see total spend on this axis here and then clothing, electronics, category and home down the bottom there. And if we look inside of the table of data, if you could call it a table of data, that aligns with what we're seeing in there as well. So it's had this language understanding of the data, but then used the execution environment to actually properly analyze the data. And beneath it here, well, we've got um, some analysis, which is actually much wider than the screen is, um, much some analysis of what that data means as far as it is concerned. So super useful. And you can start to see how powerful this is to have a code interpreter combined with your large language model. So the last thing I want to do here is I just also want to show you how we can um, get this data out potentially. So I'm carrying on the conversation here with the agent. And I'm saying format the sales data into a JSON format and save the file. So let's press play on that. And because the type of this data won't be a PNG, it won't try to render it inside of the notebook, but it should save the data out to a JSON file. And it says it has. So if we go and have a look in our files, there it is. And there is all of our data from that initial prompt saved out to a JSON structure, which means that I can now use that in a subsequent step that I might have, which is my own code potentially as well. OK, hopefully that was interesting. Hopefully that was useful. That's how to connect a code interpreter environment up to an agent um, without having to manage with your own sandbox environment and all of the security that comes with that. This is fully managed inside of agents for Amazon Bedrock. This is in public preview now. So if you've got any feedback about this at all, then please do put it in the comments below uh, and put any questions down there as well that you might have about this. If you liked this video, then please do consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel again for more videos just like this. Check out this video which I've got, which is about another public Public preview um, uh, capability of agents, which is long term memory. And there's many more videos yet to come. So until next time, I'll see you later.